On this board, we're talking about some key notes for the MLO test. What are some general characteristics of conventional loans? Well, in general, the maximum housing expense ratio for a conventional loan is 28%. And in general, the maximum total obligations ratio for a conventional loan is 36%. And regarding down payments, if the borrower is a first time home buyer, then the minimum required down payment is 3% for a conventional loan. If the borrower is not a first time home buyer, then the minimum required down payment for a conventional loan is 5%. Regarding seller concessions, regarding a conventional loan, well, if the LTV is more than 90%, then the maximum seller concession is 3% in general. If the LTV is more than 75%, but not more than 90%, then the maximum seller concession on a conventional loan is 6%. And if the LTV is 75% or under, then the maximum seller concession for a conventional loan is 9%. And if the property, now, by the way, <clears throat> um, all these percentages we were talking about is like, you know, um, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, owner occupy, right? But if the property is a investment property, right? Then the maximum seller concession is 2% for a conventional loan. Regarding late fees, the late fee on a conventional loan is 5% of just the principal and the interest not anything on the taxes and the insurance, right? Because we cannot charge a late fee on, um, on the taxes and the insurance. It's only on the principal and the interest. So the, the late fee regarding a conventional loan is 5% of the principal and interest. And just a miscellaneous note about uh, conventional loans is conventional loans have PMI. PMI means private mortgage insurance. And it's only, it only has PMI when the, um, when the down payment is less than 20%, right? Or when the LTV is 80% um, or more, right? And the PMI can be requested to be taken off when the equity reaches 20% or when the, the um, LTV reaches 80%, right? Um, that's when it can be, the PMI can be requested to be taken off. And then the PMI must automatically come off when the equity reaches 22%. Or in other words, when the LTV reaches 78%, right? So that's conventional. Now, FHA, what are some general characteristics regarding FHA loans? Well, regarding FHA loans, the, the maximum housing expense rate ratio is 31%. The maximum total obligations ratio regarding an FHA loan is 43%. Regarding down payments, well, if the borrower's credit score is 580 or above, then the minimum down payment regarding a FHA loan is 3.5%. If the borrower's credit score is anything from five, 500 to uh, 579, then the Max, then the, the minimum down payment is 10% for an FHA loan. And if the borrower's credit score is below 500, then that borrower is not eligible for a FHA loan. Regarding seller concessions, 
on a FHA loan, the sellers can set the maximum seller concession for an FHA loan is 6%. The late fee regarding a FHA loan is 4%. And as a side note, the um, uh, FHA loans have MIP, MIP, and there's two types of MIP. There's upfront MIP, as well as the ongoing MIP. And that's on FHA loans. Now, regarding VA loans, what are some general characteristics of VA loans? Well, the, there, there is no housing um, expense ratio requirement regarding a VA loan, but there is a total obligations ratio requirement, right? So on a VA loan, the maximum total obligations ratio is 41%. Um, there's no down payment required on a VA loan in general, right? In general, the, the maximum seller concessions on a VA loan is 4%. And regarding late fees, the late fee on a VA loan is also 4%. Now, VA loans do not have P PMI and they don't have MIP, but they do have, VA loans do have a one-time variable funding fee. All right, but there's an exception. That one-time variable funding fee is waived for disabled veterans and for surviving spouses. Now let's talk about USDA loans. What are some general characteristics regarding USDA loans? Well, and also, by the way, USDA, USDA loans are also called 502 loans. General characteristics, well, the, um, the maximum housing expense ratio regarding a USDA loan is 29%. The maximum total obligations ratio regarding a USDA loan is 41%. There is no down payment requirement for a USDA loan. The maximum seller concessions regarding a USDA loan is 6%. The late fee on a USDA loan is 4%. And as a side note, USDA loans have a upfront funding fee. It's a one-time upfront funding fee. Now, what are Section 35 loans? Section 35 loans are high price mortgage loans. Now, when is a loan considered to be a Section 35 loan? Well, a loan is considered to be a Section 35 loan in general, in general, when the APR exceeds the APOR by 1.5% on a first lien, 2.5% on jumbo first lien, or 3.5% on subordinate lien. Now, when a loan is considered to be a Section 35 loan, right? When a loan is considered to be a high price mortgage loan, what requirements are placed on that loan? Well, here's a way to remember this. There's, I love acronyms. And my friend Jennifer, you know, has given me, I had a study session with Jennifer and Jennifer gave me a lot of great acronyms. And one of the acronyms that she gave me regarding, um, it, well, one of the acronyms she gave me was regarding Section 35 loans. And she said, Lance, when, when, um, when you think about a Section 35 loan, think about APE. APE, the, the loan has to have APE, APE, A-P-E. And so the A stands for, it must have ATR, meaning it must, the loan must have ability to repay. So meaning, you know, they, 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 they must, the borrower, the lender must, um, you know, uh, determine that the borrower meets the, the ability to repay um, factors, the rules regarding ability to repay, right? So must have ability to repay. P no prepayment penalty unless it's in the first two years. 
and E. The, uh, the loan requires escrow of the taxes and hot hazard insurance for the first five years, right? So a Section 35 loan, it must have a APE. Now, what are Section 32 loans? Section 32 loans are high cost mortgage loans. And when is a loan considered to be a Section 2 loan? When is a loan considered to be a high cost mortgage loan? Well, a loan is considered to be a high cost mortgage loan, a Section 2 loan, when the APR exceeds the APOR by 6.5% on first lien of $50,000 or higher loan, or 8.5% on first lien of a loan that's less than 50,000, or 8.5% or 8 on subordinate lien, right? When the APR exceeds APOR by those, those numbers. Now, Regarding a high cost mortgage loan, what's a easy way, all right, what's a easy way to remember what requirements are placed on high cost mortgage loans? Well, Jennifer gave me this acronym called PAPS, PAPS, all right, B-A-P-S. So if it's a high cost mortgage loan, then it must have PAPS which is B stands for no balloon. No balloon payment can be on that loan. A must, it must have ATR, must have the ability to repay, right? Must meet those ability to repay rules, right? P, no prepayment penalty, must not have any prepayment penalty. And S, must speak to a HUD counselor. So a section 32 high cost mortgage loan must have PAPS. Now, regarding section 35 and section 32, I mentioned ATR, right? Ability to repay. Well, what are the eight factors of ATR? What are the eight factors of the ability to repay? Meaning, what are the factors that the lender considers when evaluating whether or not a borrower has the ability to repay. Well, there's eight things, eight things that the lender will consider when evaluating whether or not a borrower has the ability to repay. And Jennifer, once again, gave me a great acronym for this. She said, Lance, remember it like this, the eight factors of ATR, mice does, mice does, all right? So here are the eight factors. Number one, the M stands for monthly mortgage. The lender has to look at what the monthly mortgage payment is going to be, right? Monthly mortgage. I, the income and the assets of the borrower, right? We have to look at that. C, the credit history of the borrower. E, the employment of the borrower, right? We got to look into their employment, right? D, their debt to income, right? DTI, their debt to income ratios, right? Got to look into that. Oh, other debts, right? What, what, what are their other debts? We have to look into that. E, expenses like property taxes and insurance and, and, and you know, et cetera. You know, we have to look into that, right? Those, those types of expenses that the borrower has, right? And then S, simultaneous mortgage, meaning we have to look to see, are there other mortgages on that same property, you know? So we have to look at that. So MICE does, those are the eight factors of the ability to repay. Now, what, what makes a complete application? When a borrower applies for a loan, what makes a complete application? In other words, when is the application complete? Well, the application is complete when it has these things. And once again, Jennifer gave me a great acronym. She says, think of it as aliens, aliens, all right? So to, for, for there to be a complete application, there must be aliens, right? So A is for address, L is for loan amounts, I is for income, E is for estimated value, N is for name, 
and S is for social security, so, social security number. S is for social security number. All right. Now let's talk about the forms. The forms. There are some key forms. There, there are there are a lot of forms, but there are some very key forms that you need to know for the MLO test. Right. You need to know what is a 1003 form, what is a 1004 form, what is, what is a 1005 form, what is a 1006 form, and what is the 1008 form. Now, Jennifer gave me a great way to remember what these forms are, all right? So she said this, think of it like this, memorize the 1003 and the 1004 together. Right. So the 1003, right? Everyone should know what the 1003 is. The 1003 is the URLA, right? The Uniform Residential Loan Application, right? The 1003. Now, think of it this way though. The 1003 and the 1004 go like 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 memorize that together because the 1003 is the application, the loan application. The 1004, the next number, is the appraisal. And so if you think about it is that first you have the application and then comes the appraisal, right? So think of it like that, memorize it like that. 1003 is the uniform residential loan application. And then the 1004 is the appraisal, right? All right, the uniform residential appraisal report, right? So 1003 is the application, 1004 is the appraisal. Now. Memorize the 1005 and the 1006 together. And here's how you can think of it this way. The 1005 is the verification of employment and the 1006 is the verification of deposits, right? The 1005 is dealing with the payroll, and, you know, the pay, the payroll. And the 1006 is dealing with the bank balance. So think of it this way. First, the borrower has to be paid before the borrower can put money into the bank, right? Think of it that way. So therefore, think about how first you have the 1005, then you have the 1006. The 1005 is the verification of employment, the payroll, and then the 1006 is the verification of deposit, bank balance, right? We verify their um, pay in 1005, and then we verify their bank balance in 1006. So think of it that way. Now, the 1008 is the transmittal summary. The 1008 is the, is the transmittal summary. The transmittal summary is like the, it's the top sheet, right? The top sheet. And so you just think of the summary as being complete, like the top sheet, the summary. And so just memorize that as being 1008, 1008. So now, what, thinking about some of these laws, right? Now, ECOA, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act and the Fair Housing Act, right? There's some overlap. Now, some of the protected classes are under both ECOA and the Fair Housing Act. And then there, there's protected classes that are under ECOA that are not under Fair Housing Act. And then also there's some protected classes that are under the Fair Housing Act that are not under ECOA. So, we need to know all, like all different categories, right? So first, think of this. What are the protected classes that are under both ECOA and the Fair Housing Act? Well, there's five protected classes that fall under both ECOA and Fair Housing Act. And they are this, sex, color, national origin, race, and religion. Sex, color, national origin, race, and religion. Those five protected classes, sex, color, national origin, race, and religion, those five protected classes are under both ECOA and Fair Housing Act. Now, what are the protected classes that are only under ECOA? They're under ECOA, but not under Fair Housing Act. Well, there are three that are under ECOA that are not also under Fair Housing Act, and they are marital status, age, and public assistance. Marital status, age, and public assistance. 
And now what are the protected classes that are under the Fair Housing Act that are not also under ECOA? Well, they are familiar status and disability. Now, another topic is this. What is not included in the APR. The APR is the annual percentage rate. What is not included in the APR? Well, some things that are not included in the APR are title insurance, escrow, notary fee, appraisal fee, credit report fee, termite inspection fee, and seller credits. Those are not included in the APR. Now, let's talk about qualified mortgage. Qualified mortgage. Well, what are, what, what's the definition of a qualified mortgage? Or in other words, what makes a mortgage a qualified mortgage, right? Now, Jennifer taught me to think of it, to memorize it like this. Rules of three, rules of three, all right? Think of it this way. In, in, in memorizing the, the, the um, like definition of a qualified mortgage, right? Think of it as threes, right? All right, so number one, the points and fees of the loan of the mortgage, right? The points and fees of the mortgage cannot exceed 3%. The back-end ratio cannot exceed 43%. The prepayment penalty is limited to the first three years. There's no terms over 30 years that are allowed regarding a qualified mortgage. Um, there's no toxic features, right? And there's three kinds of toxic features. No balloons, right? No balloon payments. No interest only terms, right? No negative amortization, right? Also, qualified mortgages must have ATR. And you think of it that way, you think ATR has three letters to it, right? Just so that it falls in line with our rules of three. <laughs> so. Uh, must have the ability to repay, must have ATR. As a side note, qualified mortgage, it protects the lender, right? It is considered a safe harbor for the lender, right? Qualified mortgage. Now, how long do we have to keep documents as an MLO? How long are documents kept, right? Um, so here's the thing, the SAR and the CD, they have to be kept for five years, five years. The SAR, right? The uh, Suspicious Activity Report is the SAR. Sus suspicious, suspicious Activity Report, SAR. SAR and the CD, which is the Closing Disclosure, those two documents have to be kept for five years, at least five years. Now, the LAR, right? The LE and the LOC, must be kept for at least three years. ECOA must be kept for at least 25 months. And everything else must be kept for two years. So the way to memorize this section about you know, how long um, documents must be kept, just think of it like this. Memorize what must be kept for five years. Memorize what must be kept for three years. And memorize what must be kept for 25 months. Right. Once you memorize those, then you can think to yourself, everything else must be kept for two years. All right. It's a great way, great way to to memorize it. Now, let's talk about the MMLS number. The NMLS number goes on certain documents. Right. Now, you might get a question on your exam that asks you what documents will the M, what documents will the NMLS number appear on, all right? And so here are some main documents that will show the NMLS number. The 1003 URLA, right? The loan application will have the NMLS number. The promissory note will have it. Mor mortgages will have it. Advertisements will have it and trust deeds will have it, right? Now, as a side note, what's a document that will not have 
a NMLS number appear on it. An appraisal report, right? Remember that. An appraisal report will not show a NMLS number, right? But the NMLS number will go on these documents, the 1003 URLA, the promissory note, the mortgages, advertisements, and the trust deeds. Now, let's talk about flood zones. What are the flood zones? Well, the high risk flood zones are A and B. The moderate risk flood zones are B and X. And the low risk flood zones are C and X. Now let's talk about RESPA disclosures. What are the RESPA disclosures? Well, Jennifer gave me a great acronym to memorize what are the, the RESPA disclosures. Jennifer told me, think of it as Camilas, Camilas, K-A-M-I-L-A-S. The K is for the Know Before You Owe handbook. The A is for the Affiliated Business uh, Arrangements, the AFBA, right? All right, that's what the A is. Uh, the M is for the Mortgage Servicing Disclosure Statements. Um, the I is for Initial Escrow. The L is for the List of HUD Approved Counselors. The A is for annual escrow, and the S is for the servicing transfer disclosure. Now, in addition to those, though, also keep in mind that the GFE and the HUD are also RESPA disclosures, but the GFE and the HUD are used for non-purchases, non-purchases, right? Now, what are the penalties? What are some of the penalties regarding certain violations, right? Well, regarding the um, GLB, right? Graham, Graham Leach uh, Biley Act, right? Regarding the GLB, it's five years, uh, I guess up to five years and a fine. Um, regarding, sending a, um, regarding sending an unauthorized fax, that's $500, right? We have $500. Um, regarding RESPA, Okay, a violation regarding RESPA, that's 10, 000, up to $10,000 and or one year in jail, right? Regarding ECOA, up to $10,000, right? Fine. Regarding TILA, well, regarding TILA, violation regarding TILA, that's $5,000 for a single, right? $25,000 for reckless and $1 million for knowingly, right? committing a violation, a TILA violation. What about the SAFE Act, the, uh, uh, violating the SAFE Act? That's 30,000, up to $30,058, $30,058. What about DNC, right? The do not call list, that's $43,280. What about HUMDA? Humda, that's based on a penalty matrix. And what about FACTA? FACTA, that's $5,000 and or one year in jail, right? All right, so those are penalties. But maybe like double check these so that you kind of become more clear. But in general, these are some notes regarding the penalties. Now, what about TILA disclosures? What are, what are, Tilla disclosures. Well, Jennifer gave me a great acronym. She said, think of it as this. She said, memorize it as brawl on closed caption TV. A brawl on closed caption TV. All right. So brawl CCT. All right. So the B stands for balloon notes. R stands for right to rescission, right? A stands for arm disclosure. W stands for when your home is on the line. L stands for loan estimate. C stands for charm booklet. C stands for closing disclosure, which includes partial payment policy. And T stands for transfer of mortgage. Now let's talk about the tolerances. Tolerances. What are the 
things that have a zero tolerance, zero tolerance. Well, think of it as trail, trail, T-R-A-I-L. Tra T is for transfer taxes, R is for credit report, A is for appraisal, I is for interest rate, and L is for loan origination. Those things have a zero tolerance, a zero tolerance. Now, what things have a 10% tolerance? Well, government recording fees, also title insurance, if the title insurance is on the lender's list, right? So if the borrower chose from the lender's list and really anything that is chosen from the lender's list is, has a 10% tolerance. Now, what are the things that have no tolerance at all? There's no tolerance for it. I mean, meaning, meaning like, like, like there, there's no tolerance requirements, meaning it can be whatever. And there's no, there's no to tolerance um, requirement. Well, that's hazard insurance, termite in inspection, title insurance, if not chosen from the lender's list, because if, if the title insurance was chosen from the lender's list, then it would be under, you know, it, it would have a 10% tolerance, but the, but it, you know, title insurance that's not chosen from the um, lender's list, then would, would not have any type of tolerance requirement. Um, and then pre, also prepaid interest also has no tolerance requirement. Now, something to note though, finance charges do not include what, like, like there's certain things that are not included in finance charges. What are those things? Well, some things that are not included in finance charges are points paid by the seller, bona fide and reasonable fees, appraisal fee, notary fee, credit report fee, security interest charges, if itemized and disclosed, right? So hope you enjoyed that. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat box below and I'll see you next time on the next video.